everyone and welcome. My name is Gabby and I'm the Director of Outreach and Engagement here at Florida Atlantic University's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today for our final Marine Science Friday lecture of the season. This lecture series highlights graduate student research and we've paired up two students who are working on similar topics. Our speakers today are Kirstie Tanberg and Renee Miller Xavier who are both students in uh, FAU's PH IV Integrated Biology PhD program. Their presentation today is titled Marine Natural Products from the Seafloor to the Medicine Cabinet. And so the way that today will go is Kirsty will present first, then Renee, then we'll have some time to answer your questions. So please feel free to use that Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen. And with that, Kirsty, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, let me just share it here. All right. Can you guys see my my uh, slide? Yes, looks good. Awesome. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, and again, thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time out of your schedule to attend the last um, Marine Science Friday uh, lecture of the semester. My name is Kirsty Tamberg, and like she said, I'm joined by Renee Miller Xavier, and we are going to be talking about marine natural product drug discovery, which is the topic of our dissertation research. So before we get started, I wanted to put this into context um, and take a big step back and remind everybody about some uh, ocean facts. Um, we know that the ocean makes up about 70% of the Earth's surface and is home to over 2.2 million marine species. Um, many of these species uh, are found in the most biodiverse places uh, in the ocean, which are the coral reefs. But these reefs make up less than 2% of the ocean floor. Um, and also they're home to over 25% of marine species. So what this creates is areas of high competition, which drives the evolution of secondary metabolites. So what are secondary metabolites? Um, these are chemicals that are made by the organism that aren't critical for survival, but they do provide some type of advantage to the host. So they might help um, an organism colonize new space on the reef, direct larval sediment, stop predation. Um, but really why we're interested in them is because they're really unique and diverse um, compounds that uh, may be a source for new medicines for people. So um, turning to nature for medicines is not a new idea. Um, uh, actually, 62% of all small molecule medicines come from natural products, and some of them I'm sure you are familiar with. For example, penicillin comes from a fungus. Um, morphine comes from poppies. Um, but there are marine examples that you might be less familiar with. So yodelus is a drug used to treat soft tissue sarcoma, and it comes from a marine tunicate. Um, halovin is used to treat breast cancer, and it comes from a sea sponge. So how do we go about accomplishing this? Um, this complicated figure is a little overview of our talk today, um, and it illustrates two of the arms of um, getting from the seafloor to the medicine cabinet. Um, I'm going to talk about my research, which is illustrated by the top arm, um, and that goes through the chemical extraction, purification, um, bioactivity ident identification, and a little bit of mechanism of action work. And then um, Renee is going to go over the genome mining and bioinformatics um, research. So these two different pathways um, can be done independently or in tandem um, and really complement each other nicely in trying to get from the C4 to the medicine cabinet. So um, marine natural products drug discovery is truly a multidisciplinary effort. Um, it requires skilled engineers and taxonomists to um, operate submersibles and 
collect the samples um, into the chemistry lab, it requires skilled analytical chemists um, to purify and elucidate the structure or determine the structure of these organic compounds. Um, then onto the biology labs, um, it requires uh, very talented cell biologists um, to test and identify a variety of different techniques. And then um, a newer field, which is becoming to be very important um, in this world of drug discovery is genome mining, which um, again, I will leave for Renee to talk about. Um, so before any of this work can be done, the samples must be collected. Um, so since 1984, Harbor Branch has been collecting samples and building an impressive library. And initially, most of these samples were collected with the Johnson Sea Link, which is Harbor Branch's um, manned submersible. Um, nowadays, they're mostly collected with uh, ROVs or remote operated vehicles in collaboration with NOAA or the Cooperative Institute. Um, so if you're interested in exploring a little bit more about the samples that have been collected, I recommend you check out the website um, at the bottom of my screen. This is a really awesome new database that's been put out by the biomedical research group here at Harbor Branch that catalogs virtually every sample that's been collected over the past 30 something years. Um, and it has pictures and videos and it's a really awesome place to spend some time exploring what people before us have explored. So um, in the 30 something years that uh, Harbor Ranch has been building this library, over 30,000 macroorganism samples. Um, so marine invertebrates like sponges and corals, um, even sea cucumbers and tunicates have been collected and over 19,000 microorganism samples have been collected. Um, so from these organisms, over 150 novel compounds have been identified, and this list is just growing. So how do we extract these compounds? Um, you can think of the extraction process similar to brewing a cup of coffee. So when you make coffee, you take hot water and pour it over coffee grounds, and you're left with your favorite caffeinated beverage. But in addition to caffeine, coffee may contain about a thousand other chemical compounds. Um, and that's very similar to the extracts that we get from our marine organisms. But instead of pouring hot water over them, we use organic solvents to extract our organic compounds. And we get what we call a crude extract, which is our cup of coffee. Um, so we actually also go a step further um, with these crude extracts, and we separate them into simpler mixtures of related compounds, which we call peak fractions. Um, and you can see some of the chemical peaks um, in this chromatogram. Um, so once we have these peak fractions, they're tested in a variety of biological assays to identify unique activities. And um, in the history of Harbor Branch, and especially the Wright Lab and Guzman Lab, um, a variety of activities have been identified um, from antimicrobials to antiparasitics, antivirals, and especially anti-cancer compounds, which is the topic of my research. Um, so again, to take a step back and acknowledge some of these sobering statistics um, of cancer in the United States, every year over 1.5 million people are diagnosed with some form of cancer and over half a million people die uh, every year. Um, another way of looking at these statistics is that one in two men or one in three women will be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. Um, additionally, many cancers are developing drug resistance. So there's a huge need for new therapies and hopefully we all recognize how important and worthwhile this research is. More specifically, my dissertation research revolves around a protein called Survivin. So survivin is a protein that is upregulated in cancer cells. That means it's overexpressed in cancer cells. And um, it's involved in a multitude of activities, um, but its two primary functions are in facilitating cell division or tumor growth and blocking cell death. Um, so you can imagine if we were able to identify some uh, natural products that were able to block 
those functions or hallmarks of cancer, um, it could be a really valuable therapeutic. Um, additionally, survivin is found to be overexpressed in many cancer cell types, and I won't uh, read all of them to you. The list goes on, um, but this uh, research could serve um, to find a, a pretty broad spectrum therapeutic. So hopefully you're already convinced, um, but I'd like to share what I think is the significance of this research. So Survivin is a relevant tumor specific drug target that facilitates cell growth and prevents cell death. There's currently no FDA approved drug on the market for Survivin inhibition and Harbor Branch's collection of marine natural products serves as a unique resource to mine for these possible uh, therapeutics. <clears throat> so um, we went about uh, trying to identify compounds for, <clears throat> from the marine natural products library with the ability to reduce um, levels of surviving in cancer cells um, by designing an assay, um, an immunofluorescent screening assay to screen uh, the library and find um, compounds that, like I said, reduce surviving levels. Um, so the Guzman lab did this um, by screening the cells in 384 well plates. Um, and they were fluorescently labeled so that they could visualize increases or decreases in surviving um, in response to treatment. So you can think of each well in the 384 well plate like an individual test tube. Um, so that's how I'm going to illustrate that for you here. Um, the first step is that cancer cells are seeded into these plates and allowed to adhere. They're then treated with the chemical treatments or natural products um, and those incubate for 24 hours. Um, the cells are then fixed and labeled with fluorescent antibodies and stains. And what you're left with is uh, fluorescent cells that are ready to be imaged and will allow us to see those increases or decreases in survivin. So here are um, some of the images we're able to obtain from this assay. Um, in the blue, you can see that the cells are stained um, with a nuclear stain that binds to the DNA and, and labels the nuclei of the cell. Um, and then in the red, we have a, a antibody stain for survivin. So we can literally visualize the survivin protein in the cells. Um, this is what the image acquisition and analysis looks like. So we have this high content imager, which is a fancy semi-automated uh, fluorescent microscope, which gives us these fluorescent images. And then um, we're able to use Meta Express image analysis software to quantify the increases or decreases um, in the cells in response to treatment with natural products. So here's a little bit of what we're looking for. Um, you can see in the top row, we have our control, which is just what the normal cancer cells look like. Um, I want you to focus in on the surviving um, panel. And you can see that there is a high level of survivin expressed in normal cancer cells. Um, but if you look at the bottom row, when the cancer cells are treated with a survivin inhibitor called YM155, you can see that there's a huge decrease just visually. Um, and it's about 60, over 60%. So from this screening assay, a variety of compounds were identified, or a variety of fractions were identified um, that were able to reduce survivin. And one of the ones that I worked on was from an octo coral, which is a soft coral. Um, this one was found in the deep sea off the Canary Islands. And this fraction was found to have about 60% surviving reducing, survive and reducing activity in the high content imaging assay. But if you remember, it is a peak fraction, which means it's a mixture of similarly, similarly related compounds. Um, as you can see here, each of these peaks is an individual compound. So once we have a hit, the next step is to try to purify out the single active compound responsible for what we're seeing. Um, so we separate out these mixtures of compounds with liquid chromatography um, via bioassay guided fractionation. Um, so once we get a pure active compound, as you can see right here, um, the next step is to um, determine the identity 
of this compound. So we're able to um, do that with a variety or with a couple different tools. Um, one of those tools is high resolution mass spectrometry or mass spec. Um, and it gives us information on the molecular weight or the mass of our compound and can help us determine um, what atoms are in our molecule. Um, so that's like the chemical formula. Um, another tool that we can use um, is called nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR. Um, and that gives us more structural information. So how the molecule is put together. Um, and I will just uh, use this to illustrate that. So this is a 1D single pulse pro proton spectrum of um, one of my compounds. And in this spectrum, um, each of these peaks represents a single proton in the molecule. Um, and the chemical shift or where these peaks fall on the baseline is determined by the electronic environment of that proton in um, the structure. So using uh, this experiment and other 1D and 2D NMR experiments, you can collect pieces of the puzzle and put that together to determine the structure. So this is actually the chemical formula and the structure for YM155, which you saw on um, a previous slide. So now that we have a pure active compound and we know exactly what it is, um, the next goal of my research, um, if you remember, was some mechanism of action work. Um, and just to preface, determining the mechanism of action, the full mechanism of action uh, for a compound in the cell is a huge undertaking and could be an entire PhD project or multiple PhD projects. So um, I don't want you to think I'm determining the full mechanism of action, but I did want to try to get started on that and make some progress or headway in figuring out how our compounds might be acting in the cells. Um, so in order to explain this part of my project, I want to remind everybody or introduce um, the concept of the central dogma of biology. And that is where um, DNA, which is the genetic material and the instruction manual, um, if you will, for our cells and our body, is transcribed to RNA, which is um, the messaging molecules. And then this RNA is translated to protein. And protein is what makes up your body and does the work in your cells. Um, so the central dogma is DNA to RNA to protein. Um, another important pathway you should be familiar with, especially for surviving, um, is the degradation pathway. And this is accomplished through the proteasome. Um, so you can think of the proteasome kind of as a garbage disposal. Um, the proteins, once they're not needed anymore, um, or if the cell wants to regulate expression, uh, is targeted with ubiquitin molecules and directed to the proteasome. The proteasome chops up the protein into amino acids and the protein's no longer functional, of course. Um, so this is how survivin is expressed and moves through the cell. Um, so my hypothesis, I guess we'll go back. My hypothesis was that we could classify our inhibitor molecules into two main groups, depending on where they're acting in this pathway um, to achieve the same result of reduced survivin levels in our high content imaging assays. So option one was that uh, the survivin simply isn't being made in the cell. DNA is not being transcribed into RNA, and we can measure that with an experiment called RTQPCR. Um, option two is that survivin is being made, and the protein is there, but it's being eliminated in the cell. So there's an increased degradation of this protein, and I can measure that with a Western blot experiment. So to explain option one, I first need to introduce um, PCR or polymerase chain reaction. And I think um, actually the public is probably more familiar with this concept or at least aware of it than um, ever before, because if any of you have recently had a COVID test where you send a swab out and a couple days later you get your results, that was a PCR test. Um, so PCR is basically just a way to amplify and detect the presence of DNA in a sample. Um, so how it 
works is really in three main steps, um, denaturing, annealing, and extending. In the denaturing step, um, you can look at this piece uh, of double-stranded DNA. Um, when you denature it, you break that double strand into two um, and expose the bases. Um, in the next step, annealing, you take primers that are specific to a particular region of that DNA and have the complementary bases to bind to only that region. Um, and they bind to that piece of DNA and allow the um, DNA polymerase to come and synthesize your DNA. So in the extension step, the DNA polymerase elongates the strand and matches up the complementary bases so that you're left now with two copies of DNA. So as you can see, you went from one copy to two copies. And then as those cycles repeat, you get four copies and eight copies until you're able to make millions and millions of copies and detect the presence of that DNA. Um, if you remember, the experiment that I'm doing is called RTQ-PCR. So that's a form of PCR. Um, the Q in that acronym stands for quantitative. So that means I'm not just looking for a yes, no. I want to measure how much exactly was there to begin with. Um, and then the RT portion, um, if you remember, stands for reverse transcription. So that just means I'm starting out with RNA, reverse transcribing to DNA and measuring that because I want to measure the expression of survivin, which we get through the RNA measure. Um, so to answer my question, number one, is survivin being differentially transcribed? Um, I measure this with the experiment called RTQPCR, which you're all experts on now. Um, and if you look at my data, my compound 40633, which is the pure compound from my octocoral did not reduce survivin um, mRNA transcription. So that means it's not option one. Um, if you look at YM155, which is our known survivin inhibitor, and it's actually a transcriptional inhibitor, we can see that there is a reduction. So we know our assay is working. Um, it's just that my compound doesn't work through that pathway, which is fine. Um, so the next step was to see if it might be option two. Um, and if you remember, that option was that survivin is being transcribed um, and made into protein. It's just that the protein is being rapidly degraded. And that's why we see a decrease in the protein levels in our high content assay. Um, so this is a measure of protein that I do through a Western blot. And to accomplish this experiment, I plate my cells into a 24 well plate and allow them to settle overnight. I pretreat with cyclohexamide, which is a protein synthesis inhibitor. And basically what that means is that I'm blocking off the synthesis pathway because I only want to look at the pool of survivin that's existing in the cells already. Um, I then treat with my survivin inhibitors and um, extract protein for a variety of time points. Um, so once I have my extracted protein, I separate that. So I move on to my Western blot protocol, which is as follows. Um, I separate that purified protein on um, a gel, a gel with gel electrophoresis, and that separates the protein based off of size. Um, I then transfer that protein onto a membrane, which allows me to blot with antibodies. Um, and I'm then able to visualize um, how much protein was in my cells similarly to how we could visualize with the high content imaging assay. Um, but instead of looking at the levels of protein within the cells, we extracted the protein and we're looking at how strong these bands are. Um, so this assay is actually ongoing currently. Um, and so I don't have my data to share with you, but I wanted to show you from the literature what an example might look like. So um, when uh, in this experiment, we expect survivin to be degraded through the proteasome, just like it normally would be in the cell. So the DMSO represents the normal cancer cells, and there's a certain degradation pattern. If you treat with a compound that is increasing degradation rates, you would, of course, expect to see a much faster degradation of survivin. And that's what we are expecting to see and looking for. Um, I do have some preliminary data uh, that I'm not sharing with you today that does suggest 
um, that my compound from the octocoral may be increasing the degradation rate of surviving compared to control, um, but that is to be continued. So I hope you are all uh, now familiar with how I take um, marine natural products from the seafloor to the lab bench, and um, I am going to turn it over to Renee. Hello, thank you very much, Kirstie. So Kirstie and I, our projects share a similar goal in discovering new drugs from the vast Hopper Branch collection. And although our techniques are different, um, we share some common steps, including extraction, purification, and identification. So I'm extracting nucleic acid from the marine organisms. Um, so Kirsty is interested in a coral. My research is on a sponge. So the DNA is extracted and then sequenced. Um, and I'm extracting the nucleic information from not only the sponge, but also the microorganisms that reside within the sponge. And this is illustrated with the different colors of the double-stranded DNA. So the DNA sequencing takes these double-stranded DNA and it translates the biological information within the cell into computational information with the product being sequencing reads. These sequencing reads using bioinformatics undergo a quality control step where we, dis where we throw out um, any of the erroneous reads through the sequencing process. And then those reads are assembled into longer pieces of DNA called contigs and scaffolds. Um, with, from that, using bioinformatics, we can then identify secondary metabolites and uh, using gene annotation. And then we can start looking for the met metabol metabolites present within the DNA and identify the genomes of the microorganisms that are producing those secondary metabolites. And so with the end result being um, taking those genes and putting them into a biological factory to mass produce a natural medicine that then will go on to um, the clinic and start healing patients. So my project that I'm going to talk to you today focuses on leodramatolide, which is a small compound that was extracted um, in the right lab from the deep sea sponge Leodermatium. Um, the Guzman lab then used that extract in biological assays and found that it is a fierce cancer fighting medicine. And the research that I'm speaking about today has been funded by the Save Our Seas grant. Um, some fun facts regarding leodermatolide is that it's a polyketide macrolid, which from previous research tells us that it is most likely produced by a prokaryote, either a bacterium or an archaea. Um, the Guzman lab discovered that leodermatolide induces cell cycle arrest in multiple human cancer lines, including pancreatic cancer, skin cancer, breast, and colon cancer. And this is significant because it will allow us to treat multiple cancer, um, become multiple therapies for different cancers. Additionally, Leodermatolite is selected for malignant over healthy human tissue, which is significant because we're all very familiar with the side effects of chemotherapy, the hair loss and the nausea. And if we have a compound that's just specific to the tumor, then our patients will be experiencing less side effects. Also, it has a unique mode of action, which means it's a novel therapy that cells have not yet developed drug resistance to. 
Additionally, there are two different chemotypes of the um, laodematium sponge, meaning that there are sponges that produce the compound laodematolite and that there are others that do not produce it. From my pers genetic perspective, this is important because it allows for a robust genetic comparison where we can identify then the genes that are responsible for producing laodematolite. In preclinical trials, there was a small mouse trial that was done, which showed that the laodermatolite compound significantly reduced the tumor weight in mice from the um, treatment, the, the common treatment versus the control. So this is very promising. Um, and now we need to bring it to human trials. The problem though, is that of supply. So these sponges are located in the deep sea um, and they're a natural resource that cannot be harvested and we're not able to grow them in the laboratory. And so, and there's also the option of chemical synthesis, um, which many labs are continuing to undergo. However, um, chemical synthesis of liodermatolite is not very efficient for scale up. Um, it's a long process with a low yield. So what my group is recommending is that we focus on the microbes that are producing the natural compound. And if we can discover how nature is producing it, then we can harvest that information and undergo um, heterologic expression in a common microbe like E. coli so that we can scale up for mass production and get this compound to the people that need it the most. So we, I've been speaking about how these hosts, so for example, the sponge has microorganisms that reside within it. And the microbes and the sponge make up the holobiont. And as you can see from this figure, sponges have a large diversity of microorganisms that live within the sponge itself. Um, and these microbes have many different functions. Um, so they live symbionically within, so it's both advantageous to the sponge and the microorganism. And interestingly enough, these microbes are transmitted through the larvae. Similar to how the mother seeds an infant during birth, the larvae are also um, extending these, these microbes to their offspring. And we have seen from previous research that there are all domains of life represented within a sponge holobiont. So, and this figure was looked, you, was made using uh, ribosomal RNA genes. So um, for prokaryotes like bacteria and archaea, we look at the 16S subunit. And for eukaryotes, we look at the 18S subunit. And using a technique that um, Kirsty just introduced, quantitative PCR, I'll be looking at the, um, the ratio of these two genes in the sponge in order to identify high microbial abundance sponges. Um, another interesting um, point is we don't yet understand if there's a role of viruses in these sponge um, microbiomes. And I also wanted to um, bring this up again about how DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins, um, which are these proteins are the workers who are assembling the, um, the small compound. Similar to how a car is manufactured in a plant. So as you can see from this figure, there are lots of machines or the, the workers, the hands that are putting parts onto the chassis of a car. And as this car moves forward, different machines are adding different parts. This is really similar to how a small molecule or a secondary metabolite is produced. Except in this case, the workers aren't machines their macromolecules are proteins. So proteins can, um, can do work within the cell. And the, the parts that are being assembled are actually primary metabolites that are being assembled into secondary metabolites. And this process has been um, predicted um, by Gujan Wang. 
And he predicted the biosynthetic pathway of leodermatolite. And so these macromolecules are represented by these circles here. And you have a, um, a small molecule, which is being elongated and passed from one module to the next and is slowly growing and branching. Um, and this process, um, of predicting this pathway is called retrobiosynthesis. So because of all the work that was previously done in the Wright and Guzman lab, we know the structure of leodermatolide and, and um, we can predict what the, uh, the workers are that are needed to produce this compound. Um, so the laodermation sponges that I worked on were collected right off the coast of Florida in the Miami Terrace and the Portulas Terrace um, using deep sea submersibles at a depth of 40 meters. And they were collected between the years of 2004 and 2015 and were stored at in the freezer um, until we went and collected them for my project. So my colleagues and I collected about 70 sponges, um, six grams of tissue each. And then I under I did a DNA extraction method comparison, really similar to the process of a chemical extraction. You have your sample, you undergo um, binding to a membrane, and then you the what you want binds to the membrane, you wash up everything you don't want, and then finally you're left with a pure uh, nucleic acid from, from the sponge. Um, and I compared three different DNA extraction methods, the traditional speed tab method, and then two kits, a soil kit and a tissue kit. And this was done on a very small subset of the samples before we scaled up and extracted DNA from all 70. Um, and using also polymerase chain reaction, we decided to move forward with the power soil kit um, because it was able to recover more of the genetic information from the sponges, from the microbial um, uh, 16S RNA. Um, and as you can see here, the as we as we would predict, the longer the samples had been in the minus 20, um, the less DNA we were able to recover. But still, we were able to recover quite a bit from all the sponges. So that was very promising. Um, the next thing that I needed to do was look through all these 70 sponges and identify those that had a high microbial abundance. And I did this by comparing the quantity of 16S RNA, that's the subunit from the prokaryotes, and the 18S RNA, which is the subunit from eukaryotes. And those sponges that had a ratio of greater than 1,200, um, those are the ones that we went forward for sequencing. Um, of those 32, we put eight on our in-house shallow sequencer. This is called the iSeq. And so each sample recovers about 500,000 reads. And so we looked at four producers and four non-producers. And so the metagenomic workflow starts with the computational information. So we have these sequencing reads that go through a cleaning process. Um, and we, so we started out with 5 million reads and we went down to 4.4. And the stats on the genome is it's 60% um, GC and each read is about 125 base pairs. That's each nucleic acid. The next step is to assemble these sequencing reads into contigs and scaffolds. Um, and so I use three different assembly tools, Metaspades, Megahit, and IDBA to do these assemblies. And here you can see a comparison of the metrics of each of those different assemblies and assembly tools. And ultimately, I decided to continue with the merge read assemblies that was made using Metaspades because the assembly performance score was 431, which is the um, quotient of the N50 and the, the MAP rate. 
Um, looking just at the, the reads, um, you can align the reads to known databases to get a quick look at the taxonomy. And so as of right now, because of all the research that has been done in the field, the database includes 70,000 genomes from both bacteria and archaea. And looking at these, these are Dip, these are the individual sponge samples, and you can see that it's a very complex environment. So it's 13 um, bacterial phyla and two archaea phyla are represented within the Laodomation sponge. And, um, and you can also see that viruses are, do not play a significant role. There's a little bit of virus DNA there, but not much at all. Um, the next step is to do a genetic comparison between these two chemotypes to identify those um, taxa that are unique to either the producer or the non-producer. The next step in my metagenomic workflow is to take these contigs and scaffolds and assemble them into metagenomic assembled genomes or MAGs. And we do this by grouping the contigs and scaffolds by their genomic signatures. So that's like their nucleotide frequency and their coverage. And so if you remember, we originally got the nucleic acid from the entire organism, the sponge and all of its microbes, and we threw it all together onto a sequencer. And now we are um, segregating those genomes out um, using bioinformatic tools. And next, we want to look to see if those genomes are complete or if they include contamination. And so we do that by looking for 107 prokaryotic single copy genes. So these are genes that should only be represented once in a prokaryotic genome. So the green indicates that only one copy was detected. The gray means that it should be there, but it's not there at all. And then as you look at the contamination, that's if the gene was present more than once. So these three mags um, were binned and had a high, um, a, a high completeness and low contamination rate. So these were the three that I went on to look at their taxonomy. Um, so the mag two is a uh, thermoplasmata. Um, I also have an actinobacteria and a data bacteria. So the data bacteria occupy a niche capable of recycling um, dissolved organic matter. And it's been suggested that these organisms may recover phosphorus or cellular for cellular demand from the dissolved organic matter. So, um, and on the gene tree, you can see here that they are outliers. So these three genomes are unique to the databases. Um, my project's next steps is I'm going to continue to mine for these biosynthetic gene clusters and then scale up my workflow for um, the deep sequencing reads that are that we now have access to. And once we've identified the biosynthetic gene clusters that produce laodermatolite, we can undergo a process called heterologous expression, where we take the biosynthetic gene clusters and insert them into a, a host similar to E. coli, which then we can uh, culture and then extract this chemical compound, um, laodermatolide, which then we can use for, um, for human, human trials. So in summary, I wanted to show how Kirstie and I's product projects both work together. So um, she used the, the chemical techniques combined with the biological techniques. Um, and you can also use genome mining to predict the, comp the chemicals that would be within the sample and also predict their biologic activity. So the drug discovery process is very, um, um, you know, the genetic aspect and the chemical and biological aspect all work together um, to continue to discover drugs from the Harbor Branch collection. 
Um, the drug discovery pipeline, it's a long and risky road. So right now we're here in the pre-discovery um, phase and um, hoping to get into the preclinical trials. And once we pass the animal trials, um, once we have a supply of laodermatolite, we can then go on to, to clinical trials. But it's a, it's a long and risky road for drug discovery. Um, next, I wanted to talk about the importance of marine diversity. So with the increased um, ocean temperatures leads to ocean acidification, which is just detrimental, as you can see from the slides or from the figures on the right, to our coral reefs um, and also to sponges. So these pictures were taken off the Australian Great Barrier Reef. And this uh, coral bleaching um, happened within a matter of 100 days. So the coral, um, coral bleaching is devastating for uh, marine diversity. Without diversity, we don't have all these microorganisms that are capable of producing um, these diverse natural products that we then want to use to, to treat um, our patients suffering from different human diseases like cancer. And so ways that we can try and minimize our carbon footprints um, are these six steps. So um, try and use more public transportation, possibly buy an electric car or a bicycle, you know, use less energy, so less hot water or install solar panels. Um, three is to implement the reduce, reuse, and recycle. My friend also talks about refusing, so refusing to use plastics, um, which I know can be really hard in the grocery store, but try and come up with um, alternative food packaging or trying to buy in bulk. Um, we know that cows um, are also uh, responsible for some of the CO2 and the methane, so maybe eating less beef could be an option. Um, planting trees, using less paper by transitioning to digital, and then, um, you know, contact your representative and continue to support these marine protective environments, um, which also don't allow trolling of our, our coral reefs. So I want to say um, thank you very much to Harbor Branch, and if you would like to support the research that Kirsty and I do, please uh, consider purchasing a specially licensed plate. Um, once the ODVC is open, come and take a visit Gabby and see all the wonderful um, educational um, platforms that she has there. Um, I know the Ocean Science Lecture Series are currently virtual, so um, it's possible to attend those virtually. And then um, whenever we get back to normal, um, you can come and tour Harbor Branch and, and see our research firsthand. So I wanna thank you guys all for your um, attendance and um, I want to thank my dissertation chair, Gojun Wang, um, Amy Wright, Peter McCarthy, and Tracy Mincer, who are all on my dissertation committee, um, my lab members, my colleague, Kirsty, and of course, Harbor Branch Oceanographic Foundation for funding all of my research um, through the IRL JIRA Fellowship and also the Save Our Seas. Thank you. Virtual round of applause to both of our speakers. Really excellent presentation. Thank you so much. It's really fascinating to think that the cure to some of these diseases is just waiting beneath the waves and that we're on our way to discovering them. So I think that's great. And Renee, I really liked your message about um, conservation and the importance of preserving these habitats for all of the great benefits that they have uh, to our humanity. So really wonderful presentation. A reminder to our audience, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask our speakers your questions. And I'm going to go ahead and start with a question that I'll ask to both of you. Um, so graduate school, what has been the most fun experience that you've had or the coolest discovery? And what's been the biggest challenge and how have you overcome it? So it's a two part question. You can answer both, <laughs> you can answer one. Uh, Kirstie, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I have two parts of graduate school, I guess, that have been um, my favorite. Um, one, obviously, getting into the field um, and getting to interact with the environments that we study, because uh, for Renee and I, especially, 
we have pretty lab or computer intensive um, projects. So it's nice to be able to connect with nature and remember why we're doing what we're doing. Um, another really awesome experience I had in graduate school um, was working with my advisor, Amy Wright, um, and she was able to teach me um, chemistry <laughs> and structural elucidation and topics that I was not at all familiar with before. Um, and it really is like a, a fun puzzle. Some uh, people like Amy are much better at it than others. Um, we might pull her out of the audience to identify some of these structures later on. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was really fun and not at all what I expected. Um, so yeah, that was my favorite part. And struggles, um, there have been lots of struggles, <laughs> but I think they've all been lessons in tenacity and pushing through and so far so good. <laughs> That's great. I think that in a graduate program, one of the biggest skills that you learn is uh, pro problem solving and how to think critically. And so um, those are all things that will be useful to everything we do in life. And I like how you called um, it basically just a puzzle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> structures and, and everything. I, I like that analogy. Renee, would you like to answer next? Of course. So when I first came to Harbor Branch, it was to work on this project, Laodermatolite. Um, unfortunately, pancreatic cancer runs in my family, which is never a good thing. And so knowing that there needs to be new treatments. I was very interested in working on laodermatolide. And when I came here, I didn't know what that project was going to look like. Um, and as you know, so I didn't know anything about metagenomics or computer science or bioinformatics. And I have absolutely fallen in love with it. So I have stumbled upon really um, this, this new method of mining genomes for you know, marine natural products. Um, and so that's, that's been my favorite thing about the grad, my graduate experience is that I was introduced into a subject that before I didn't know anything about and I have since now um, become very versed in um, these skills. So that's been really amazing. Um, the, the, I guess the dislike is that because metagenomics is such a new field um, that really has exploded within the last 10 years because of the uh, um, next generation sequencing. So you remember back in 2001, we were able to publish the human genome. Um, that project alone took, gosh, um, many, you know, many years to do, billions of dollars and like 20 international organizations. And nowadays you can sequence your own genome for a couple, you know, maybe a thousand dollars, you know, 23 and me, we're all very familiar with. So sequencing has come a long way. And with that, the tools needed to um, explore genomes and metagenomes are really evolving. So it's been, um, it's been very challenging, but one that I'm definitely up to. That's awesome. And yes, like you said, there are so many applications for this work. And even now, and Kirstie, I like how you've related um, to COVID and how people are familiar with PCR and, and they've probably heard of mRNA and, and proteins, um, you know, just in this last year. So um, there's so many applications with so many things. It's really amazing. Definitely. And Renee and I talked about, you know, in putting this talk together, uh, we're both really passionate about ocean conservation. Um, and awareness and whatnot. And we really love using this research as a platform for that, um, connecting with, you know, an audience that might not be motivated by just ecological data. You know, like if, if the ocean contains cures to all types of diseases, then it should serve to motivate people um, even more. <laughs> yeah, to protect it. That's a really great message. Absolutely. I really like that you um, you brought that up and you've used your research as a way to teach people about conservation as well. That's awesome. So we have a question here from Nolan, who is tuned in, I think, to all of these uh, Marine Science Friday lectures. So shout out to Nolan. Great to hear from you. Uh, he says, great job to you both. It's wonderful to see how much your projects have evolved and have progressed since I met you. And best of luck with your continued work. He has a question for each of you now. Okay, so we'll start with the one for Kirsty. What are your most 
and least favorite NMR experiments <laughs> interpret. Spoken Ooh. like a true person that's been in the lab. <laughs> Hi, Nolan. Yes, Nolan has been an intern in our lab um, a few times. So, Hi, you're doing well. Um, putting me on the spot here. I think, um, so in solving my structure, I'd say one of my favorite um, experiments that isn't part of the suite of normal experiments that you run um, was probably the HGBC. Um, so, and uh, I hope I say everything correctly now that I'm on the spot, but um, that allows you to see correlations um, between protons and carbons that have a cozy correlation. And so um, there's a lot of overlap in my structure and that really helped me tease apart um, some of that overlap. Awesome. Very good. And Renee, here's your question from Nolan. He says, uh, how are things, or how are you going to incorporate the knowledge of natural product biosynthesis into your thoughts on marine conservation and ecology? Yeah, so one of the biggest messages from my research is that these natural products are being produced by microbial symbionts, which are very sensitive to their environment. So as our oceans are warming, um, you know, the corals and the sponges, um, their microbes are not, they did not evolve in these environments. And so the warmer temperatures causes the coral bleaching or these organisms to expel their, their symbionts, which the host cannot live without. And so, um, you know, as far as marine conservation, it, it's, really, it's really a message of reducing your carbon footprint as far as um, minimizing the, the temperature rise. I mean, they're saying that in some areas, there's going to be a rise of four degrees Celsius, which is really, I mean, imagine when you have a fever, you know, um, four degrees Celsius is, is, you know, if it consistently maint is high, you know, you yourself are not going to survive with your temperature changing. So these microorganisms also cannot survive in those temperatures. And so um, interestingly enough, some of the sponge um, data that I was reading is that, you know, sponges and coral have been around a lot longer than us. And so they are very adaptable. And so there is research that corals are producing like a, like a vibrant sunscreen to protect themselves, which I thought was absolutely amazing. But again, if we want to, you know, support these, these you know, these sensitive organisms as they go through this, we need to conserve their habitat, you know, so minimize your carbon footprints, you know, so we can lower the, the temperature of the oceans, um, you know, continue to represent, to, to contact your representatives and um, support these marine protective areas um, so that we can, you know, preserve these reefs that are home to these different marine organisms and species um, that are so important for marine natural product discovery. Hope that answers your question, Nolan. <laughs> well said, Renee. And it's true, our coral reefs, they really are the rainforest of the sea. And so they are. The great things out there left to be discovered. We've got another question now. Anne says, have you, uh, this is for Renee, have you had success in mass producing these compounds using E. coli or other bacteria? So this actually is not part of my project currently. My lab mate, Jackie, she has been doing this heterologous expression where she's putting these really long pieces of DNA. So these, you know, these big biosynthetic gene clusters and, and, you know, and, and forcing them into these genomes of these other organisms. And so um, this is also a pretty new field. There's been um, labs that use like um, artificial chromosomes in order to, you know, accept these large pieces of DNA. Um, and it's a work in project a process for sure. Um, so our lab as of right now is not, not producing these natural products, but it's in the works. And Jackie is very tenacious. She's another PhD student. Um, and she works very hard at this. And so, and she has a lot of support. So as of right now, no, but we will be. 
Awesome. Well, um, best of luck to Jackie and we'll have to have her do a presentation for us next year. <laughs> you can follow up on her findings. Great. Well, I'm going to ask one final question before um, we wrap up the series. And that's that you're, you're both candidates, right? You're almost, you know, done with your research. And I know this is a million dollar question. And I used to hate when people ask me this, but <laughs> Um, what is your dream job and what do you plan uh, to do after you graduate? Oh, <laughs> um, so I am planning to graduate uh, later this summer. Um, so I am currently applying for jobs and uh, fellowships and whatnot. Um, I, when I started, I, I really wanted to to um, eventually open my own biotechnology company doing drug discovery. So that's my dream, dream, dream aspiration. Um, and the reason why I wanted to be in control of my own company is because I wanted to be able to invest as much as possible in conservation and communicating with the public and everything like that. Um, but until then, um, I'm open to wherever life takes me, I think. Um, getting into industry would be really awesome um, and working in the pharmaceutical uh, industry. Um, I think getting more research experience through a postdoc would be awesome. I think learning, you know, the other side of a lot of uh, things like marine policy and whatnot would be really beneficial um, for my future endeavors. And so I'm just keeping my options open um, and seeing where life takes me and looking into a couple different directions. <laughs> Those are great options. Very good. Renee, do you like to answer? Yeah, so hopefully, fingers crossed, um, I will have finished my PhD in one year. So the end of next spring semester is the goal. Um, you know, that heterologous expression of, of the Leodermatolide biosynthetic gene cluster, um, you know, if that becomes part of my PhD, if I can fit it in, I will. And if that means maybe extending a little bit longer, so be it. But it kind of depends on how long it takes to actually get the cluster and um, how far Jackie has come along with, you know, her cloning success. Um, you know, and if all the stars align, then, you know, hopefully at the end of my PhD, maybe we can actually start mass producing Leodermatolite. That would just be amazing. And I would add on a little bit of time if I needed to. But my long-term professional goal is to teach. Um, I love teaching and, um, you know, metagenomics is such a new field. Um, for example, at FAU, there is not courses in, um, in the research that I do. So, and, and a lot of colleges don't have courses that talk about um, metagenomics and the skill, you know, the bioinformatics skills needed in order to analyze these, you know, these massive biological data sets. Um, so anyways, so I would really like a teaching position at a university um, that and continue to do some research as well. That's awesome. Well, you're both phenomenal researchers and excellent science communicators. I learned today from your talk. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and I think with that, we're just about um, out of time. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you um, for your presentation today. And thanks to everyone who's uh, tuned in. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, this is the last marine science uh, seminar of this season. But we are still running our ocean science lecture series and our next one will be this coming Wednesday. So please tune into that. And uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to watch any of our virtual tours or any of our past lectures, you can visit the virtual tour page on our website, www.fau.edu slash HBOI, and you can check those things out. So with that, thank you all again, and I hope you have a great weekend.